in school, you know, you're given a lesson and then you take a test. The problem is with money in life, you sort of take the test and then you learn the lesson. Welcome to the Rebel Health Coach Podcast with Tom Underwood. Armed with truth and knowledge, your journey to a healthy lifestyle can be obtained. Preventative wellness, quality nourishment, and daily fitness routines dramatically improve your outlook on life as a whole. And you'll find the support and info you need to accomplish a healthier lifestyle here. Together, we can empower each other along our journey to an amazing you. On today's episode of the Rebel Health Coach Podcast, I have Peter Lazaroff. Peter is a Chief Investment Officer at Plain Corp, which manages over $4 billion for its clients. And he is the author of the book, Making Money Simple. He is here to share complex issues and make them manageable to just about anyone. But I'm sure you're wondering why I'm interviewing Peter today about his book, Making Money Simple. Well, let me break this down for you. Stress is a key factor in five out of six leading causes of death. Heart disease, cancer, stroke, lower respiratory disease, and accidents. An estimated 75% to 90% of all doctor's visits are stress-related issues. The percent of people who regularly Experienced physical symptoms caused by stress is 77%. And regularly experienced psychological symptoms caused by stress is 73%. The biggest cause of stress in America today is money, which continues to be a leading cause of stress in all Americans. The cost of daily living, bills, kids, jobs, this is stress we tend to ignore and push down. Left uncontrolled, this stress affects your health, your body, and your immune system. I hope you enjoy this episode and take a lot of great information from it. Thank you and enjoy the show. Peter Lazaroff, welcome to the Rebel Health Coach podcast this afternoon. Well, thanks for having me, Tom. I'm glad you joined me. I know this is an unusual platform to have an interview with a financial person, but let's face it, money and money management is a major stressor for all people, as I stated in the intro today. But before we dive in, I want to give the listeners a brief introduction of who you are and what you do. Sure. Well, so um, as you mentioned, I'm Peter Lazaroff. I am a chartered financial analyst and a certified financial planner. So I have lots of cool letters on my business card from years of study. And um, my day-to-day job is that of chief investment officer at a wealth management firm called PlanCorp. Um, we're a national independent firm with offices across the country. And we help individuals and families uh, really fulfill all their goals and values through making good money decisions. And I think a place where we stand out in particular versus a lot of other advisors, we really just make sure people don't get killed on taxes in the process. Everyone should pay their tax bill in full, but you don't have to leave the IRS a tip. So, you know, it's kind of one of the, you know, we're really um, skilled in financial planning. And I got interested in finance at a really young age. My grandmother gave me a share of Nike stock when I was 12. And I have a birthday. It's December 20th. And I remember sitting near a Christmas tree and getting all these video games and toys. And here I get this share, this piece of paper. And I go, Grandma, like, <laughs> Grandma usually gets me the cool gift. Like, what's going on here? Um, and she goes, Well, you actually own the company that, of who makes those shoes and that t shirt you're wearing. I'm like, Oh. And I was really fortunate in that, you know, this one stock I was given happened to do really well. And so I think when you're a young kid and you, Think you own a company and it's going up in value seemingly constantly. It was really, really a fortunate purchase by grandma there. And getting these dividend checks in the mail for doing no work, I was totally hooked on the idea. And so um, I always knew that I wanted to do something with stocks, which is pretty broad reaching. But when I came out of college, I started as an analyst and trader and started working directly with clients maybe three years after doing that. And um, I've been at PlanCorp now for almost 5 years and I authored my first book Making Money Simple this that came out this year I write regularly for the Wall Street Journal and for Forbes uh you know, on CNBC and do a lot of TV stuff and speaking across the country but generally speaking I I feel like the big passion I have around finances to me it's very much like a puzzle that can be 
put together um, or a problem that can be solved. And I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. And if anyone ever reads my writing, you know, it's really about education. And I think there's so much opportunity these days to educate people on finances because it's not something that you learn about in school. And right. not a lot of people have those conversations with their parents when they're kids at the dinner table. You know, there's not a lot of opportunity to learn about money. And so I, I just really feel like the book itself was a great opportunity to give a very holistic view on the system that I used myself to help accumulate wealth, as well as the system that I use with our clients and I use with families and friends and giving away the worksheets that I created when I was 22 and still use today. It has really been a, an unbelievable experience. Uh, very hard. Writing a book, I'm not sure I recommend it to everybody, but really been rewarding, especially also because it leads to opportunities to, to talk to people like you about important issues that are related to finance. Right. And it's sad that our high schools and schools don't teach money or nutrition. From my end, it's nutrition. They don't teach nutrition. They don't take teach well-being. They don't teach health. They don't teach managing with stress. They don't teach money. Yeah. It's up to the parents. And that's a lot of responsibility. And not all parents know much about nutrition or taking good care of their body or especially with money. And I think you know, it, it, if you don't have the base knowledge yourself, how are you going to teach your children? And if you... You know, an adult, it's up to you to figure it out. And if you have had bad habits in the past, past with either your health or your money, and some, you know, things are just a, a result of circumstances. You can have really bad luck with your health too, but you can always make changes. And it's little changes, the little changes you make that you don't notice over time. They, that those benefits, both health or financial, tend to compound into incredible outcomes. And and that's a really big theme throughout a lot of the material that I create both in the book and otherwise. And I think regardless of where you are in life, there's always an opportunity to make a small change. You don't have to go run a marathon tomorrow, but you could take a walk. you know, And that can turn into something. And over time, those little uh, habits and behaviors really do turn into something impressive over the course of time. Right, right. I, I don't remember where this quote came from, but I heard it somewhere. Little by little, a little becomes a lot. I like that. Yeah, that's so true. That's really good. I wish I had that in my book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't remember who I, who said it, but it's true. A little, and, and with my clients, even it's like, okay, walk. Let's start with walking. Right. You know, park the car away, especially at the grocery store. Don't have to park close to the door. You know, park at the end of the lot and walk. Just yes. those little things become a lot. Well, and I'll say, my, so my exercise of choice is lap swimming, which to most people sounds like torture. And it right. was at first. And the first time I ever did it, I could only do about 6 laps and I was done. Um, but now I can do uh, you know, 40 laps if I need to in without stopping. But that's the type of thing. There was a small progression over time that increased. It wasn't like I tried to go from 0 to 100. There was actually something I googled, how do you swim a mile? And there was this program, it's called 0 to a mile. Uh, it laid out the program for me. It made it real easy and it was very progressive. And it's the same thing with anything I do with work. You try to take off little chunks and those little chunks turn into something eventually. Right. Yeah, I, I just think that it's easy to get discouraged when you don't have immediate results and right. outcomes from exercise or with your finances. But those are two things. And it's a little cliche sometimes to compare like physical health with your finances. But there are so many uh, parallels where... You know, you go to the gym once, you're not going to have a six pack. And just because you save fifty dollars once, you know, you're not going to have a large bank account. Except that it will compound over time. So, right. in many ways, you do get to leverage, um, you know, the power of compounding in your finances a little more than with it in your health. But it is a very similar um, stage and platform for making improvements. Hmm. Yeah, you're right. I mean, how much was that stock when your grandma gave it to you? Well, that's a great question. So I'd have to go look up the basis. I have now officially gotten rid of all individual stocks in my portfolio. And that was the last one I held for sentimental reasons. But I know that it was up a little over a 1000% by the time I, okay. I actually didn't sell it. I gifted it to charity so that I wasn't uh, didn't incur taxes. And I gift charitably anyways. Right. The technique to save on your tax bill. But uh, it it really was a special gift. She gave me a different share of stock each birthday from ages 12 to 18. Some of them worked out great. You know, there was Microsoft and there was Nike, 
But there's was, there was Disney, that one I think did pretty well. But there's other ones that didn't do so well, like Nokia. You know, I remember when I had a cell phone and I was 18 and she bought me Nokia and I was thinking, this is going to be the world. And that one turned out to be kind of a stinker. She got me <laughs> app at one point. But it was really, again, it was such a great learning experience. It was such a neat way to connect with my grandmother who was really passionate about investing. And uh, my grandfather, actually from my mother's side, so this was different set of grandparents. He was also really passionate about investing as well. And once he knew I was interested, it gave us something to talk about too. And really fortunate that when I was at such a young age to have this passion turn out to be something that I wanted to do professionally as an adult. I, I just feel so fortunate to to have that all happen that way. Yeah, that's that's very fortunate. Like I, I, now that I'm doing what I do now with my patients and clients, I missed the boat. I I should have been a doctor because I I love. Me too. <laughs> I, I love going. I love studying the physical anatomy and what 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 like a, a carb and a protein have to do with you know what it does to our body or what exercise does to our body. The interconnectedness is amazing to me, and, and money's not. I mean, I'm honestly, I'm probably one of those guys that could use somebody like you because I'm horrible at this. You know. Well, and most people just want to make sure they're doing the right thing. Right. And you don't have to be an expert, but you do have to... I think it's important to understand some basics. And um, I think the thing is that in school, you know, you're know, you given a lesson and then you take a test. The problem is with money and life, you sort of take the test and then you learn the lesson. <laughs> and money and lessons can be pretty expensive. And so... You know, everybody by you know in the later stages of their lives eventually end up acquiring a lot of money lessons through making mistakes right. or maybe getting lucky and doing it right. Um, I think the more you can educate yourself at any stage of life, the the less expensive those lessons become. Right. Um, but also, just feeling confident that you're in a good place because it can be so stressful to have all these different decisions to make and you don't know where to start. And even if you do choose where to start, the number of options to select on that place you're working on can be overwhelming. And so I think a little bit of education can go a long ways towards reducing that that anxiety and stress that so many people experience when they encounter their money. Right. You're, exa- you're 100% correct. Let's, get, let's dive into the book. Bit, one question before I do. I don't know if I should say this for the end or not. What, what are your feel, thoughts on Bitcoin? So when Bitcoin got really popular around Thanksgiving of, I believe it was 2017, uh, I had a client email me and I wrote, I think, what equated to a 4,000 word response, which is a very long response for people who don't write like a single page in a Microsoft Word document, single space is about 600 words, maybe a little less. So 4,000 words is pretty extensive. And you know, I ultimately turned it into a blog post, which I'm sure if you Google my name and Bitcoin, you know, you'll probably... Do it. My general view is that um, you shouldn't invest in something unless you understand it. And right. I, in this blog post, provide a lot of resources to help you understand it. I don't think that if you have, there's nothing in my own financial plan that requires owning some asset that's going to go completely bonkers to make it work. And so if you're buying Bitcoin because you think it's going to make you rich quick, that's not really a good plan with any investment, Bitcoin being good or bad or indifferent. I would say that nobody can know with certainty what role Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency will play in our future. However, I will point out that the United States and China, for that matter, were working on cryptocurrencies before this stuff got popular. And people have been doing blockchain technologies well before this all became popular. And so knowing who the winner will be is very difficult. It's kind of a trader's uh, game, but I... Someone in my neighborhood, a few houses down, had a lot of their wealth in Bitcoin. And when Bitcoin dropped 60%, and this was about a year ago, you know, that nearly knocked them out of their house. And so oh, that's wow. really a situation, you know, you got, take if you're a lot of times, I think you should have your core investment assets that are for long term goals in retirement, and you're going to be really disciplined with them, and you're going to have somebody give you some guidance, whether that's a human advisor or a digital advisor. But it's okay, in my view, to have a small amount of money set aside as like a, a way to express yourself. And you know, people don't like calling it a play account. They're like, well, I'm not playing. I'm investing. But in reality, it's the, ty- it's the amount of money that wouldn't hurt you if it went to zero. Okay. Um, and so I do know people who have assets in that way. And knowing why you're getting in and why you're getting out can be important really in any investment. But I think particularly so in Bitcoin, where most of the people who I know who own it don't actually understand what it is that it even does. Uh, and so I think if you get, if you Google and 
I can send you a link for, for some show notes if you want on this blog post. But I'm pretty sure if you Google my name in Bitcoin, Google's pretty smart. It'll probably... I think, it's, I, the think right I saw it in your, in your blogs on your website, though. Yeah, yeah. So the yeah. blog on my website has everything I do, even if it's from Wall Street Journal or Forbes or on TV. Everything eventually makes it back to my um, to my website, so you okay. can always find it there. Yeah, yeah. That's I I I I'm one of those people that have no idea what the heck you do with the Bitcoin. Well, you hopefully watch it grow. I think there's right. a point in time where it was going up so much in value that no one would spend it. So it was supposed to be an alternative currency, but if people are holding it and never want to spend it because they always know it's going to appreciate. Well, then it's not actually serving its purpose. And there's a really... I mean, cryptocurrency has a lot of good use cases. And I think it's way too early to know the winner. It would be kind of like if you had in 2003, you know, knowing that Snapchat was going to be a thing. Like, because okay. cell phone camera on my cell phone, and I was mentioning I had a Nokia phone around 2003... That camera barely, you know, it was all fuzzy. You wouldn't actually publish a picture. Who knew that cameras on our phones were going to be better than the cameras we walk around with and take big pictures? And then who knew what products would come out of them? Instagram, Facebook, all this stuff. You know, so knowing who would be the winner in cryptocurrency would be a lot like knowing, you know, two decades in advance who was going to be the winner of the internet. Um, okay. You know, it just wouldn't have been possible to know. But certainly, um, yeah, the blog post on my blog is called Should You Invest in Bitcoin? And uh, there's a lot of resources there, and you know some required readings, some videos, some podcasts, so that you can learn more about it. I generally am not a fan because I just think that a traditional, simple portfolio and good saving habits can more than cover what you need to reach your financial goals. Okay. All right, let's dig into the book. I just want right. to throw. I should have probably waited on that, but oh well. I like that's a good it, question. I like it. I mean, it's been on the top tip of my tongue because I know a couple of people that dabble in it, and I'm like. They're like, you should get in. I'm like, I don't know, I don't know what it does. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat what I said about it and we'll jump right. into the book. But the, if you need to own something that's going like just completely bananas in order to make your financial plan work, then you don't really have a good financial plan right. in place. Or you don't have one in place. That's, so I think that's the key point. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's dig into the book. First of all, Making Money Simple. Let's, let's go over the title a little bit. What? Why? How How is it simple? How do you make it simple? So I think I struggled with the title. I'll be honest. I struggle with every blog title I've ever written for the record. So titling things, I had a long list. But I know that my primary skill as a writer, as a speaker, uh, is that taking complex ideas and distilling them down into something simple and digestible. And money has so many different tentacles that can reach out and go so many places. I wanted to really just focus on a few key places to focus your attention and allow to simplify it so that you can repeat the process yourself and make good decisions over and over and over again with minimal effort. And so by simplifying the topic of money... Because there's really two ways you could interpret the title. It's either making money simply, kind of, or making the topic of money simple. I really was going for making the topic of money simple. Um, but there is really the process that I follow myself and we guide our clients and I've been using for a long time that it doesn't have to be hard. It's not easy, but it definitely does not have to be hard. You just need to know what's the most important things to focus on. And so that's really where the title came from um, and was the inspiration for the book. Okay, cool. I like the title. I bought the book. I have I, I dug into it a little bit before this episode, but I plan on uh, reading it. Cool, yeah. thanks. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it because this is, like I said, I'm I'm guilty of this. This is one of my bad habits. So it's one of my Achilles heels, and I'm I'm real. I'm about uh, uh, tackling my Achilles heel. So, well, it's a big step. I mean, just taking the action is pretty important. And uh, shortly after writing the book, I created something called SmartMoneyQuiz.com. And and smartmoneyquiz.com really is just nine questions for people who don't know where to start. And at the end of it, you get three or four places to focus on right now. And also shares a lot of the resources that are in the book in those kind of, hey, go do this. And here's this resource. Uh, But as you read the book, I think you'll start to see that, yeah, money all these years, it really hasn't doesn't need to be that complicated. I can keep it simple and just move on and not worry about it. And that worry factor is is really important to, to overcome there. Well, yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, 
stress has developed because of the worry for, and, and like I said in the intro, is that money is the number one, stress is the number one leading cause of disease and, and, and money is the number one cause of stress. Yeah. So, and I mean, I'm not immune to it either. I hired a financial advisor this year. I am a financial advisor. I hired Plan Corp because I started realizing between juggling my job, I mean, if you have a job, just because I'm a financial advisor doesn't mean I have, don't have time, you know, I have time right. to do all these things for myself and someone to hold me accountable. It made me feel way less stressed. And it also gave me an objective third party to bounce ideas off of and to make sure things don't slip through the cracks. So we're all, Susceptible to stress with money, and you know, or if you're living a busy life and you feel like you don't have time for it, like you got to find at least one place to make it easier on yourself. Exactly, and and not only is money a number one stress, it is also a number one number one cause of separation and yes. relationship arguments. Yeah, and I talk a little bit about that in the book. Actually, now it's geared more towards people who are combining their finances for the first time, but certainly open, honest communication about money is really important uh, in marriages and in partnerships. And if you don't have that open communication, there can be animosities building up and there can be confusion and misconceptions about what's actually happening with the money. Now, a lot like sports, when you're winning, you know, clubhouse drama can send teams, send the teams to go away. Whereas like the bank account, if it's always going up, you know, even if you don't have good money habits with your partner or your spouse... You know, the issues tend to cover themselves up, but taking intentionality into the equation, I think that's a lot of what helps people who are having money issues. And the sooner that you can establish those open lines of communication, the better off or the least likely that is going to be the stressor that causes uh, marital problems. Right. Right. Well, let's dig into... There's a couple of things I want to touch base on, uh, including one we'll talk about at the end is... Uh, is the hiring, how do you hire somebody? But one thing I noted in the book that I did get to is the three cru- crucial elements of building a strong financial house. What well, we want people to go read this book, so we don't want to give it all away, but could you touch base on those? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll go super high level. I think one of them is intentionality, which I sort of mentioned, and that comes out in the form of setting goals and the process that I describe in the book um, and the worksheets that I have that you can download for free um, or you can use the ones that are in the book. They make the setting of goals and how you are going to set up your savings program highly intentional. Um, Once you've made all these important decisions, the second crucial element is automating as much as possible because look, we're forgetful people. um, We're emotional people. We sometimes will deviate from the path. And by automating you really eliminate the opportunity to make a bad decision. Um, so that intentionality and goal setting is the first one. The automating it is the second one. And then the third one is really to find ways to leverage the compounding, the power of compounding in all areas of your financial life. So most people tend to think of compound interest in their bank account or their investment account. And that is truly super, super important. But there are other areas where compounding comes into play, like costs, like like uh, automation of saving habits, like the hiring of somebody and the amount they're saving you little bit by little bit and those habits. And I think the one thing that surprised me when writing the book was I understand compound interest. It's part of my job. When I started writing about the power of compounding on habits in addition to compound interest, I think I gained a much bigger respect um, that I was unaware of. And, and that's a lot of what writing does. It helps crystallize your thoughts. But that's probably the biggest thing I learned from myself in writing this is how important it is to find every little opportunity to leverage the power of compounding. Because all of us, whether you're you know 30 or 40 or 60, you have multiple decades uh, to have all this stuff compound over time. And while you may not notice the impact initially, you know, over 10, 20 years, this stuff is really, really enormously important. And so... Not just doing the obvious stuff, but doing around the edges, the little things that can make a big difference over time. That's what makes compounding that third crucial element. Okay, okay cool. What is reverse budgeting? This is another one I was interested in. Yeah, this is great. So I used to keep a budget in a spreadsheet and I would update it. Maybe not every day, but every few days. And I knew exactly how much was going to restaurants or gas or everything. Every little detail, gifts. The problem is 
traditional budgeting is really not fun. <laughs> I mean, updating a spreadsheet isn't great. It's restrictive. If I set a budgeted amount for dining out and I hit that amount, but my best friend calls me the next day and says, we're all going out to dinner for, for, for their birthday. Well, am I not going to go because I've already hit my budgeted amount? It just doesn't seem realistic. And what right. reverse budgeting does is it focuses more... So what happens in a traditional budget is you budget out what you're going to spend and then whatever is left over, you save. Reverse budgeting does the opposite. It takes your goals and figures out how much do I need to save per month to meet these goals in the next 5 years. And the goals have different due dates you know, over a 5-year span. And once you figure out how much you need to save, you automate those savings and then you just live off the rest. Now, you can't spend more than you earn. It doesn't work that way. Um, the reverse budget only works if you don't go into debt. But what it does is it focuses on savings and you can't spend what you save. And so ultimately, it treats that savings like a bill and it is super intentional of which goals it goes to, then you don't have to update a spreadsheet anymore. And you can live more flexibly. Um, and it really does paint a picture that allows people to understand, okay, well, this money is going to a car account or a house account or a vacation or an education or retirement. And you bucket these different types of accounts. And it makes it easier to conceptualize what is do what your finances are doing overall, and as well as allows you to track your progress towards different goals in a more meaningful manner. Let me ask you a question. This is something that I struggled with for a bit, and I'm learning how to fix myself. But when you're making these bank accounts, these this savings account, I I know when when I started, I put it in my bank I use on a regular basis. But what happened is I started dipping into that because it was easy, easily accessible. Yeah, that happens to a lot of people. What I describe in the book and what I do in practice and I do myself is that if there is a goal that I'm saving for, I want an account open for that goal somewhere that is not my primary checking account. My primary checking account is really like a train station where you know money goes in and it immediately goes out to all these different places. And online banks, one, they tend to pay higher rates. I also have some accounts open you know, at our you know, investment firm and our digital platform, BrightPlan, where the account title is vacation or education or retirement. And it makes it harder to get to. And when you see the account name is for something like emergency or retirement, you aren't going to tap it unless it's for an emergency or retirement. And I think naming your accounts and there, you know, when I started this system, I didn't have the ability to manually change the name of my accounts online. I had to like do a ton of paperwork. Well, now any sort of online platform you use is going to allow you to establish what is this account for. And when you go to tap it, I guarantee you'll be able, you'll feel really guilty about tapping money that's not for the purpose you're doing. The other thing is, if it's on an online bank or in, in a brokerage account somewhere else, there's a time lag between when you can get a hold of the money. And so that kind of slows down the process okay. of you from making that decision to grab it. So definitely would discourage you from using your primary bank is the place where you set up these different right. accounts for different goals. That said, you know, having a cash cushion at the bank, you, know, it, you have to do that, especially if you're going to be automating finances because you don't want to have like an overdraft at right. some point. Do you, in the book, is there recommendations for online banks? So there, I don't call out that because okay. there felt like there was just compliance issues with that. Right, but right, what right. I say now, I mean, I think Synchrony, Ally, uh, American Express, Capital One, they all have online banks that pay higher rates. Uh, the digital platform that we have set up called BrightPlan, it has uh, a higher rate for emergency funds, but also allows you to do goals-based investing. So you might go into the platform, set up a retirement goal, an education goal, a buy a car goal, a charity goal, all sorts of whatever goals. And you direct it to it, and the platform, based on how you've set up the goal, might say, "Well, maybe you should invest in some mix of stocks and bonds for this," or, "Well, this is an emergency fund, so we're going to keep it all in cash, and here's the rate you earn." Um, I think Bright Plan is probably the only one I mention in the book again because it's just easier from a compliance perspective here. But okay, but yeah, the Synchrony and Ally they tend to have the highest rates. Um, I don't think you need to chase the highest rate all the time. Like, pick the website that's easiest to use. Right works for you and just stick with it. You're not going to earn enough changing your money in banks every few months. Yeah, I, 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 I use Ally and I've been happy with them. Yeah, and I use... Um, myself, I use Capital One, which used to be ING. And I started doing that in, I think, 2008. And once I started using them, they definitely don't pay the highest rate. 
but I just don't feel like moving it. It takes right. too much time. And so there's an area, again, I, I have an advisor, maybe he's going to tell me to move it at some point, but to earn an extra, you know, tenth of a percent, I just don't think it's worth right. the hassle for me at this point, especially right. because I have so much automation built into the accounts already. All right. I th- the name Capital One scares me to begin with, so I'll stick with Ally. <laughs> <laughs> Ally is <Ally's> a great <laughs> choice. <laughs> I don't know why, but Capital One is just like, ah! <laughs> like, okay. I'd Fair rather enough. go, I'd rather go throw th- weights around than go, go use Ally or Capital One. Right. So that's the point. If there's really no grand difference in them all, right. you just got to pick the one you like. Right. Yep. Yep. And now for a little general housekeeping. If you are enjoying this episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you would go to whatever app you are listening to this on and rate and review the show and share it with your friends. Thank you very much. Now, if you've been listening to my episodes for the last couple of years, you'll know that I key on gut health quite frequently in my episodes because honestly, the gut health is king. And pretty much all disease begins in the gut, as Hippocrates said back in 420 BC. So that's a reason I key on gut health quite frequently because if you're trying to do something simple is just lose weight, your gut health is key. So I have been developing a gut health cheat sheet over the last few months for you to download. And you can obtain this gut health cheat sheet by texting the word gut health, two words, gut health to 773-770-4377. Again, gut health to 773-770-4377. Four three seven seven. Thank you, and I hope you continue to enjoy this episode and make it a great day. All right, let's talk about the smart money quiz a little bit. Sure. What is it? I mean, I put it's going to be in the show notes. All the links will be in the show notes. Your website, the book, how to where to get the book, worksheets, and other things, but. The smart money quiz will be in there as well. And what what is it? So smart money quiz is really just nine simple questions that allows me to... Uh, the way I built out the logic, it allows me to identify an area for you that you could focus on right now to make an improvement in your finances. And I think what's so overwhelming with your finances, particularly if you're not working with advisors, where what, where's the best place to start? And I mean, look, it takes... Two minutes tops to answer these nine questions. And what you get is, you know, these areas to focus on as well as resources that can help you accomplish that. So, you know, you might get a recommendation to do a reverse budget and you say, oh, great. Well, how do I do that? And then I provide you with the resources and instructions for setting it up. Um, I provide some of the worksheets to download that would allow you to, and, and those worksheets have step by step instructions just like the book that makes it super, super easy to making it a real improvement in your life. And ever since building it, it's really gotten positive feedback. I get a lot of messages from people who reach out after the fact, taking it, thanking me just for the simple advice. Um, it's a real easy thing you can do. If you're feeling stressed, you might take it and suddenly I give you a result. Hey, you are just doing great on everything. Keep up the good work. Um, you know That is a potential outcome and still giving you some resources if you want to improve. But you know, it might give you a little peace of mind to know where you stand. And so... You can take it from your cell phone if you just go to smartmoneyquiz.com or desktop, whatever works easiest. Okay. All right, let's talk about hiring a professional to help you. I mean, I've tried to, I've attempted to hire some people and they want me to do all, it's just overwhelming for me Mm -hmm. is hiring somebody. And also, this is one of my Achilles heels, as I mentioned, is money. And I, I really don't have time to deal with it myself. Even I want to be able to hire somebody that could just say, here's what I got left over at the end of the month. You figure out what to do with it. Sure. Well, I think there's a few things if you're going to do that that you have to look out for. And uh, chapter 12 of the book gives you everything you need to know about the different types of advisors available, as well as a process that you can go through that sort of removes bias from your decision, including the interview questions that you might want to ask advisor to make sure that they are working in your best interest. And the reason I point that out is 
there are a lot of conflicts of interest in the financial advice uh, industry. And I talk a lot about fiduciary standard. Fiduciary standard is really just a legal obligation to put your client's interests before yourself. So you go to a doctor, you're going to go ahead and assume that they're prescribing you medicine or things that are in the best interest of your health. Or if you go to a lawyer, you know they're going to try to win a case for you. They're not intentionally trying to lose. There are some standards that are lower than the fiduciary standard in this field. Um, suitability is, is really the one that comes to mind. And there's some insurance standards that are lower as well, where the advisor doesn't have to put your interest first. And I think the process I kind of highlight, like what are some of the different designations and certifications and titles on people's business cards that are impactful? Um, and I, I don't want to speak through the whole chapter. I don't want to put you all to sleep. But if when it comes down to the time to actually choose that advisor, you know, I have a process that I talk about where you know, start by making a list of firms or the people that you know who you'd consider hiring. And then as you look at this list, see if they have any of these designations that I mentioned. See if they are fiduciaries. Uh, the second step is to go to somewhere called Broker Check. Um, you can Google Broker Check. And what that does is allows you to look up the person and see if they have any regulatory incidents on their record. Really important. I mean, do you want to work with somebody who's already had to settle because of a financial issue? The third step I kind of lay out is just visiting a prospective advisor's website, which is a bit like judging a book by its cover, but you know that's okay. I think you want to see, does their message resonate with you? Are they creating content that is meaningful to your life that would signal that they work with people like you? And then the final piece is to narrow down your list to some finalists. I, I typically am shocked at how little time people commit to hiring an advisor. And an advisor is not cheap. It's not free. And if you're going to invest in yourself by hiring an advisor, you should really take your time to pick the right one. The problem is that when people interview multiple advisors, they tend to ask different questions. The meetings tend to be spaced out, and they sort. You know, we have faulty memories in general as a species, as a human species. And so, what I do is I describe um, something that was created by a Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman, who's a behavioral scientist. It's called a structured interview, and I lay out twelve, excuse me, ten questions. And here are the kind of answers you're wanting to hear if they have your best interest in, in, in heart. And for those where there isn't like a black and white best answer, I kind of talk about the different answers you might hear and the pluses and minuses of the different. That structured interview worksheet is one of the free resources you can download from my website. Um, you can obviously find it in the book. But then it comes down to like, you mentioned, what if I just want to give it to somebody and I don't really want a bunch of financial planning and just forget it? Well, maybe you can use an online advisor, which is newer in the past decade, but really offers a good low cost option for a lot of people. So for me, I'm you know a plan corp employee, which is your traditional wealth management firm where you're working with a human regularly and they're emailing you regular meetings. We also developed a second company called Bright Plan, where like other digital advisors, the experience is more digital. You can still interact with an advisor, but Really, you're investing automatically online and you're looking at it in your cell phone and you can see the progress of your goals. And I was writing this book as we were building that platform. And so there is a lot of parallels there, you know, either intentionally or unintentionally from going through that process. But I do think that it's one of the most valuable chapters in the book. There's no sales pitch within it. It's really just laying out how, the, how people are compensated, how they're held to legal different standards, what sort of services you should expect. And whether using someone who is a digital advisor, um, a human advisor, or maybe a hybrid, some combination of both, might fit best for your situation um, and costs. Okay, cool. I'll put a bright plan. Is that can they can people sign up for that without going through somebody? Well, so interestingly, because it's a financial wellness offering for corporations, um, the only way that you can get access to it is through a special link in my book or a link I can give you. It's just brightplan.com slash Peter. It's probably okay. the easiest one to spell and makes it easy. And when you use that link, you actually do get a free one month trial. It's otherwise a twenty dollars a month service. And when you go to brightplan.com backslash Peter, though you'll enter your credit card information because after a month you'll start getting billed twenty dollars a month. But you can okay. test out all the tools for a month, decide if you like it. And if you don't, you know, we don't want to charge you money for no reason. Right, right. And so it's it's really an incredible tool particularly if you've never worked with an advisor before or you feel like you don't want to pay an advisor you know, for the human fees that are involved with that. Okay. And now we, when we were talking about banks, brightplan.com backslash Peter, you can use that as an alternative savings account as well, right? 
Sure. So it's definitely not a bank that's you know reg- that right, has right. FDIC insurance. But yeah, it's it's just an investment advisory firm that's a okay. uh, digital hybrid offering. They're you can open up different accounts for different goals. It was designed to follow kind of this reverse budgeting process where you set up different goals, and we actually run some pretty cool models that are interactive with the inputs you provide. And then we provide you advice on how you can increase your probability of success of meeting these goals. If you choose to invest in it, yeah, you can open up an account through it and put money in on a regular basis. You can also just link like your 401k to it. Or if you have a Schwab or Fidelity or TD Ameritrade account, you just link it to it and it's tracking the values and updating your plan on a real-time basis. It's really an impressive tool. Uh, I'm super proud of the work that we've accomplished and my colleagues that I work closely with. I'm not an engineer. I didn't build this. Um, And it wasn't my idea either. But I feel so fortunate to have worked uh, next to so many incredible people to create this tool that, like I said, is generally being offered to corporations as a financial wellness benefit. But through this link, you can access it as an individual. If you just go to brightplan.com, you won't be able to find a way to access okay. it. Otherwise. Yeah. I'll put through that in the show notes as well. Cool. One thing that I want is, since this is a health and wellness podcast, one thing that and I deal with on a regular basis is people 38, 40 plus males and females that have health issues. And along with health issues and, and struggles in that field and in, in the health in, is that they have tend to have a lot of bills to maintain their prescription drugs. And you know, my job is to help people get off their prescription drugs, but the fight's real, the struggle's real here. Yeah. I mean, insulin prices are going up and so if you're a diabetic, that's a struggle. Insurance companies are not paying as much as they used to for those medications. So there's a big fight between big pharma and insurance companies going on because you know big pharma wants to make more. Insurance companies want to make more. And let's face it, I, as much as I just like and say bad things about allopathic physicians, they're necessary for triage to fix a disease or fix something that's actually happened that needs to be fixed you know but along with that is the is that the fact that you're 40 plus and you're starting to dwindle some of your savings account or your retirement funds because of the, your health issues or in the worst case scenario something actually tragic happens like you have a stroke right. and you are depleted of you lose your job or or you have to retire early uh, there's a lot of things that go in play. And what are some of the things for the older generation, not just health issues, but job loss, divorce, other struggles in life that actually take somebody down at this later age in life where they're supposed to be looking towards retirement or looking towards spending time with their grandchildren and they find themselves struggling to make it real? Yeah, it's so there's there's no easy fix if you haven't planned for bad health or you know if if you're if you're saving for emergencies or you have disability insurance if you have these things in place it doesn't become an issue but what do you do if you didn't have that in place and so you're drawn down on assets that were intended for something different and it's really hard when you get caught up particularly in medical bills because one they're so high and when you're they're coming frequently you are only focused in the present with your money and it's really easy and completely understandable to lose touch with the future and the implications. And even as you're in the present, you're doing it because you have to. I mean, you have to pay the bills. How do you then kind of course correct so that there is something left in the future? And just like when we, at the very beginning of our conversation, we talked about, you know, it's taking these small steps and doing something incremental that seems like it won't make a difference in the long run. And a lot of people will be discouraged and say, well, that won't make any difference. Why even bother? But see, that's wrong. You make these little tiny improvements. If it's, I've been drawing down on these accounts and now my retirement account is half of what it was or it's completely depleted. Okay, I, that, that, I get it. Let's go ahead and put $25 into a retirement account. Just do it. Let's just put one time, not even recurring. Let's just put something in there. Make Get those small wins. Find the small wins with your finances. They are very important. Inactivity is the only real mistake you can make if you're in that stage. And so... 
you know, there, I can't give broad advice that would apply to everybody in this situation other than you got to find the one action you can take and focus on what you can control about the situation. And any little amount you can contribute towards the future is going to make a difference, even if it doesn't seem like it. It's really important. And I think it's something that's actionable and you'll feel better, I promise, doing it. Even knowing that it's, it doesn't feel like it's going to make a difference that day. Right. You'll do it and it's a win. And you need those wins and those wins will pile up over time into something that does actually make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. I mean, like I said earlier, little by little, a little, a little by little, a little becomes a lot. I'm going to have to write that down so that I don't forget. I, I love it. And actually, I have it on my board over here, whiteboard. Wait, I keep forgetting what you call that stupid board, but whiteboard. <laughs> I got lots of little uh, sayings like that pinned up to my, uh, yeah. like, I, well, I don't know what I call this board, but it's like I'm pinning stuff to it. Right. So this is going to go up there. Little by little, a little becomes a lot. And, you know, it's so true because, I, you know, like I deal with people that if, if they're not sleeping well, my first, Low hanging fruit for me is to get them to sleep because you can't, your system is, needs to go into the rest and digest mode or the parasympathetic mode to reverse your disease. So if I don't get them sleeping, I can't fix, I, you're not going to lose weight. You know, sure. so that's, it's just like putting $25 in the bank one month at a time, just $25, which, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot, but $25. Ten times is, you know, I, I know what that is. I don't, I'm not good at math. See, <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, but it, but it'll turn into something different right. and grow on its own. And that's, I mean, and you might suddenly realize, actually, I think I could put in thirty next right. time. And you know, it just it, it, it's really, you know, I think you never like you never want to just go out and run a marathon if you've right. never run before. You go out and you take a walk. This is the same thing. You you got to do something that won't hurt you. You know, won't feel painful in your day to day life but still is effective and important and will feel good and is a win. Yep. And progress is the most important thing you can do. Perfect. It's perfect. I like that. All right. What are a couple of takeaways that you'd like to leave the listeners with before we close out here? Well, I think if anyone's... you know, We've talked about it a bunch, but if anyone's looking for where's the next place to start, obviously, I think Smart Money Quiz is designed just for that. Smartmoneyquiz.com, I should say. I do think that if you read... My materials, you will find some areas. You know, it's it's educational, it's actionable. You'll find ways to make improvements over time. And and this last conversation we had about just making progress, regardless if you're in a good situation or you're in a less good situation, you know, every little bit matters. And I assume that everybody listening right now has one thing they could think of, like, gosh, with their finances, like, gosh, I, I really should take care of that, or I could be doing that. And you've probably been thinking about it for a long time. This, this week, make it your goal to do that one thing. Uh, it may be big, it may be small, but do that one thing and you'll be on a better path already. I, I can't tell you how important it is to just take those initial steps. All right. Cool. Thank you very much. All right. One fun question here that I don't let my interviewee people, my interview, the people I'm interviewing know about, but if Peter were to have 30 to 40 minutes to sit and chill out and with no distractions, kids, wife, whatever, no distractions. What album or artist would you listen to? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Because I think if I'm relaxing, it's different than if I'm driving. And yeah, okay. So I'm going to think out loud to arrive at my answer here, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind at all. Uh, Among some of my favorite bands, I think of like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh, Specifically, there's one guitarist that they had for half of their career, John Frusciante, and any of those albums. And I'm already kind of talking my way. That's probably it. They have Stadium Arcadium, which is a two album. Uh, So it gives you a lot of listening. Uh, But I grew up really loving Incubus and Death Cab for Cutie. And uh, (laughs) I do... I remember loving Guster growing up. Today, I feel like when I listen, I plug in my phone in the car and I have Apple Music and I let it decide what I'm going to listen to that morning and it can go all over the map. But yeah, I think I'm going to probably go Red Hot Chili Peppers and whether I went something older, you know, Californication or as much as I don't want to use the words in there like Blood Sex Magic, you know, I think those are probably where I'm going to land somewhere in there. Okay, cool. I'm actually going to see one of those, two of those old bands tonight. Oh Um, yeah, who you seen? Uh, Bush and Live. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I definitely, you know, Bush, there's one song in particular. Bush does Glycerin, don't they? Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one that sticks out to me. Yep. I actually played in a band up until I had my first child. Uh, and then playing gigs from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. was not that's conducive it. to being a parent. But uh, I played drums and I played in a band in high school and played in college. And even when I was working, played out. And uh, I think my high school play- band played Glycerin at one point. But wow. as a drummer, that meant I actually didn't play that song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just a guitar solo and right. singing. But, but I listened right. and I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yep. That'll be interesting tonight because there are two people that uh, that I were like I listened to a lot of when, but yeah, I mean I grew up with you know Led Zeppelin and Frank Love Zappa, and, you know some of the old stuff. But yeah, one of the guys I played in a band with in high school still plays, and they do a couple of covers of Zeppelin, but they're more acoustic. And wow, it's just so much fun. Uh, you know, I just saw Jason Bonham's Led Zeppelin Evening. They opened for Peter Frampton. Oh, cool. And I was like, okay, how is this going to be? Because, but it was amazing. The guy who had a singing for pay, or Robert Plant was amazing. That's awesome. And I was like, holy, I was like, man, this is crazy. So, and it didn't look like he kind of looked, it, it didn't look the part of, you know, the big long hair with Robert, you know, Robert Plant had. And yeah, he had yep. an amazing voice. So, Anyway, I appreciate your time today, Peter. Thank you for hopping on here. You know, when Ben first mentioned this to me, I'm like, hmm. But then I started thinking about it, and I'm like, you know what? This fits. And I hope my listeners get a lot about a lot out of it because this is something everybody deals with on a daily basis. Not just, you know, it's like what you put in. Your, it's like what you put in your pie hole. You know, this is something that you have to deal with daily. And it's real. The struggle is real too, as well. Absolutely. And and Tom, I really appreciate you having me on. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. And you have a great radio voice, by the way. Well, none of the users can see my face, but I, you know, yeah. that they'll just assume that the face matches the voice. I'm glad they don't see my face. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks again. Thank you for joining in today with the Rebel Health Coach, Tom Underwood. And be sure to subscribe to the show so you can catch all the episodes. With desire and commitment, you can implement a lifestyle of wellness and fitness. For the support, encouragement, and tools you need to be successful, visit TomUnderwood.net.